Seven states have no income tax. Um, the state where I live is Texas. There's no personal income tax there. Tennessee has no personal income tax. Florida, Wyoming, I can go through them all, but you get the idea that there is a way to do it. And it, and it allows for more economic freedom and prosperity and everything else. Some of the states that have the highest income taxes, which you know, mentioned 8%, California now has a 144 Percent I know top that's income why tax rate. all the Californians are moving here. Yes, but whenever you think about Colorado, there are a lot of things that are getting right. I think whenever you think about what's happening with um, spending and taxes are heading in the right direction, as you mentioned earlier, that at least the tax rates are going down, but there needs to be more done. <laughs>
but could we really go and cut taxes? Explain how it works. We, we really can in Colorado. I mean, it's the thing to look at when you look at the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, which is the gold standard, has been the gold standard since 1992 when it was put in place. It's providing refunds today. But what if there was a way instead to limit government spending um, and use the surpluses to reduce tax rates? Instead of giving refund refunds, let's take less money out of people's paychecks whenever they get the paychecks. That way they can earn or they, all, they can get all of their hard-earned money. Instead of having it refunded at the end, they should have money in their pockets to allow for the economy to grow, put food on the table, and take care of their families. And so the research that we've been looking at here is for a sustainable Colorado budget to grow the budget by no more than population growth plus inflation, which is already what the Taxpayer Bill of Rights does, um, but include more of the budget. You know, over time in 1992, whenever Tabor was put in place, it covered about two thirds of the budget. Today, it's less than half. It's 46% of the, of the part of the budget that's actually covered underneath the spending limit. And so what we were looking at is what if we covered all state funds, exclude federal funds, just look at state funds, and use any of the surplus dollars. So you get more revenue that's coming right, let me, in. Let me, let me yeah, go this for back it. to you, see if I'm following you. Yep. So it used to be when Tabor started that Tabor covered up about two thirds of all the money that Colorado spent. And the others were in what's called enterprises or fees. And we've certainly learned our lessons on fees. And over time, the legislature has realized, you know, when we tax people, but call it a fee. We don't have to ask them for that. So we'll just take it out of the pie and put it over into this other bucket. We take it out of here, put it over there, and that grows. And it's uh, and now most of Colorado spending is now happening in enterprises out of fees. Let me, I want to make a quick diversion here because it is crucial. People should be scared to death about this. I don't care how you feel about, about uh, taxation. Yeah. Those, that other bucket is not represented by the legislature. So we elect the legislature to make priorities. That's their job, to anger certain constituents and please others and decide we want to fund research here instead of midnight basketball there, whatever it is. But when you take it out of that and, and put it into the fees bucket, all those people are appointed. You know, we had a revolution because we had taxation without representation. Now, a large majority of our budget has no representation. And the more they do these fee games and pull pieces out of the budget and throw it over there so they can increase the taxes, the less our vote matters. If you like democracy, if you like representative democracy, if this should terrify you because over time, it means our elections don't have anything to do with the most important thing the state's supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Set a budget, set priorities. You know, pretty soon they'll just be talking about what trans initiatives to pass and you know, what, what the uh, state flower needs to be again. So that's it. So, all right, now we, I'll get off my horse on, on the moral reason of that. How do we get from here to there? I think the first step here is to look at the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and to expand it back to what it was initially originally intended to be, which is a spending limit on most of the budget. Get rid of a lot of these fees and other things that are going in there that you, you're exactly right. It's not a representative form of taxation when you have all these fees that are going on and trying to run government. And you look at the burden of government being government spending. Uh, Milton Friedman said that's the ultimate burden of government. And it is. If, if, you, if you don't spend it, then you don't need to tax. And if you're not spending money on regula regulations and everything else, then you don't need a bureaucracy and all these, these employees. So that really is the burden of government spending. It is government spending. And so I think you start with that. And if you look at broadening that base of the Taxpayer Bill of Rights and say, okay, we're going to limit about two thirds of the budget and we're going to use surplus money that's coming in from sales taxes, income taxes, whatever it is, because population growth plus inflation grows at a slower rate than the overall economy, which is good. It's one of the reasons why population plus inflation is a good measure of the average taxpayer's ability to pay for government spending. I don't care what appropriators wanna spend. They're gonna wanna spend all the money, no matter what they get. 
But at the same time, we should be careful about how much we're taking out of the productive private sector. So you do that and you use surplus money to buy down the tax rates every time. So there's no cuts in government spending, although one can make the argument right, you're, for you're that. You're confusing me here. So okay. slow down. All right, all right. Talk, talk to somebody. Pretend you're talking to Biden. You've got mm-hmm. to really dumb this down. So I understand we have surpluses. I understand when we have surpluses, it makes more sense to cut the income tax rate than to refund the money. Because if we do that, people get their money fast, right away. Every paycheck is a little less, uh, a little less withholding for, for that. And you get, you get that money right away when it's worth more before it gets inflated a year or a year and a half later. All right, I get that. And I could understand putting that on autopilot and saying, hey, whenever we have, a, 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 when we have these surpluses, why collect stuff that we're just going to have to give back? And the government doesn't just give it back. It plays favorites. Mm-hmm. You, you, know, you guys all paid for it, but you're a special interest and you're a special interest and you guys are going to have more and you guys are going to have less. If you, all that goes away when you do it. What I don't quite get is this idea that you want to expand the base of what, uh, what gets considered under Tabor. Mm-hmm. Slowly explain that to me. For one thing, that's what it was originally intended to do, was to cover all state funds, not keep carving it away because of fees and other things that they want to dedicate those monies to to get it outside of it. Um, But also because that's more reflective of what the government has control over and what the legislators are spending money on. So why not have as much of the base as possible, meaning the budget base, to cover cover by the spending limit and then limit that growth rate over time so that way you're left with more money that you can use for tax rate reductions. All right. So is that, is that helpful? Let me see if I got this. <laughs> yeah. I'm waving the magic wand. All these fees and enterprise zones and enterprises, uh, we're going to say you are no longer fees. You're no longer enterprises. We're all back in one big pot here. And because of that, we're going to see that we're going to get more in refunds because there's more growth. Now, they the state has no interest in doing that, do they? What politician is going to say, hey, that's a great idea. Let's bring it all back in so that it it can actually grow under a controlled mechanism than under the uncontrolled mechanism of fees. Politicians are also rational, though. They want to win re-election. And so one way you can win re-election is having more jobs, more income, a more prosperous economy. And so if we're able to broaden the base and limit government spending, you get a direct connection with the reduction in tax rates, which has an incentive effect. People want to work more. People want to invest more in Colorado. And then that grows the economy at the same time. Um, and, and, and so there's a direct connection between those besides saying we're going to give you a refund if there is a surplus later. And so I think by putting this on the front side where you are lowering tax rates instead of giving you a refund, it also helps the politicians to have a, a, a growing economy and lower tax rates that are being paid across the state. And what's cool about this and from our research is that over the next 15 to 20 years following this approach, you could eliminate the personal income tax in Colorado. How long would it take? 15 to 20 years. All right, but at first, we'd have to bring all those fees back in. Correct, correct. And some of that would be, you know, there's got to be a look at all these ex- what's called tax expenditures, the, da- the deductions and the credits and all the other stuff they're trying to do by picking winners and losers within the tax code. Um, and, and some of those are the earned income tax credit, child care credit, and some of those sound good, right? Who doesn't want to be for those things? The problem is, is the more that cr- these, ex- these credits and deductions and tax expenditures that there are, it, it shrinks the base of the tax code. And when you shrink the base, You have to have a lower rate to bring in the same amount of taxes to fund all the increase in government spending. Lower rate? Uh, Higher rate. Ah, Sorry, yeah, higher rate. Um, Exactly right. You have a higher rate, and and really what we want is a lower rate with the broadest base possible. Let's talk about that. All right, so you you did this research uh, on on a sustainable um, budget, and it, it says what Polis wants is possible. What it means is when we have surpluses, Instead of giving them out by political means, give it out by an economic means, lower the income tax. How odd that our governor says that he wants to lower the income tax, but when he gets that surplus, he wants to keep it under Prop HH. Thank God that failed. And now he gets it and he wants to give it out in special interest breaks. So we're going to have special interest breaks for this 
special group and that special group and this industry and that pressure group. Uh, uh, ben Murray did a wonderful thing for us on uh, tax expenditure limitations or on uh, tax expenditure modifications, excuse me. And help me understand this. The governor came in and he said, I want to cut special interest tax breaks and use that money to lower the income tax. We, we like this, right? We do. The problem is that hasn't happened. They has, they has, you know, the income tax rates have went down for other reasons, but, but they've continued to expand. Governor Polis uh, has approved these, continue to expand these tax expenditures. If, so if, so in, uh, these special tax breaks. So yeah. in other words, a guy come, comes in and says, I'm going to lower the tax rate. He didn't. We did. Independence Institute. Yes. Citizens put it on the ballot. Citizens passed it. The governor uh, uh, didn't get in the way, but he certainly didn't push this through the legislature. But he did promise to cut these special interest tra- tax breaks, and instead he multiplied them. There are now more than ever. So he fibbed. He did. He, d- he certainly didn't live up to his word here. And had he lived up to his word and reduced those tax expenditures, these tax breaks, right, um, the rate could instead of being 4.4% could be 3.25%, a right. substantial cut. I want, I want to do that again. Yeah. Because this is, this is the punchline. If the governor kept his promise, cut those special interest tax breaks, and didn't add on to those special interest tax breaks, we could have an income tax right now, not of 4.4%, but three and a quarter. That's right. A remarkably low income tax rate that would bring more businesses, more jobs into Colorado, if only he had kept his promise. That's exactly right. And while he might have needed the legislature to cut those special interest tax breaks, he alone could have vetoed the increase in them. That's right. 3.25. How do you figure that, by the way? Well, that's just the amounts. Whenever you look at the increase that's happened under Polis's record, um, and you look at the tax expenditures, how much it's increased, you take that amount and you reduce the tax rate, each one of those, about $700 million per per 10 cents or per right. penny of what we're looking at in these taxes, the tax rate, um, that would get us from 4.4 to, to 3.25%. And what's interesting about that is the lowest flat income tax rate now in the country is um, North Carolina will soon be at 2.49%. Um, Arizona's at 2.5%. So this would, 3.25 would get us much closer to being more competitive. So we still have a states. relatively high income tax rate. Correct. A lot of people hate it because it's flat. Mm. They want to give it to the man. And instead of having this wide base, they want lower income folks not to pay their share, but those nasty rich guys need to pay more. When in fact, they do pay more because those tax breaks and the the, uh, exemptions and the deductions mean that a lot of people at the lower end don't pay taxes until they hit a certain level. And that balances out. But what's wrong with the progressive income tax? The first thing is, is that it's based on envy. It's based on a situation of economic envy where you think that some at the the top shouldn't have their amount of income, that hard earned income at 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 the same time. It also has this idea of Keynesian economics, which is flawed and fails time and time again, is that the money that the quote unquote rich have is just sitting idly by, that it's not being consumed and somehow consumption is what drives economic growth. But what they forget is the fact that that money that they have is sitting in bank accounts or investments is going into other people's houses and their mortgages, is going into their car loans, and it's going into investments and businesses that grow the economy and give the very people who are getting upset jobs and higher wages. There's this feeling like rich guys grab all their money and they keep it under their mattress. It just sits there. You know, let's take the worst case scenario. And this guy who's a, who's a millionaire, billionaire, he spends his money frivolously, not on, on his business, but he, he's taking women out to dinner every night and he's, and he's buying ski chateaus and all the rest. He's still engaging his money into the economy and pumping it in because somebody has to build those chateaus, somebody has to cook those meals, somebody has to keep up the ski slope. Those are the economic drivers of the state. Yes. We want them to spend their money. Mm-hmm. So we want them to make their money. 
And we also want them to come to Colorado. Right. Why would they come to Colorado if we're only 21st in the nation when they're going to Texas and Florida? And we're seeing that even with Elon Musk bringing Tesla to Texas. That's right. And possibly his entire headquarters from Delaware that has, some of their tax provisions right. are expiring. So he's thinking about moving everything to Texas. Um, and it goes to show that incentives matter. It's one of the number one things in economics, that incentives matter. Um, so whether it's higher, um, higher tax rates, higher regulations, all these things are influenced. And so a progressive income tax system is disincentivizing the very productive nature of what people want to do to grow but an you're economy. Asking, you're asking voters to, to do one more step. Mm -hmm. All I know is they're going to see this and they're going to go, well, I'm usually in this tax rate. If I'm in that tax rate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be all right. Um, instead of, and screw that rich guy. I mean, there's just a constant feeling of screw the rich guy. You know, he's not what you call a sympathetic character. Mm -hmm. To that point is that there's a lot of talk about who's rich and who's not, but you know, there's a lot of movement of who's rich. Those people don't just stay rich all the time. There's also a concern that they just inherited all this money, um, but a lot of them blow that money at the same time and they move out of the top income rate, uh, classes as well. It's also interesting to, to think about Imagine that you're in a state that has no personal income tax. So I, I imagine that every day. Yes. <laughs> as I'm sure many in the audience do as well. Um, I happen to live in one of those states in Texas. I live near Austin, Texas. Um, I had the opportunity to work in the Trump administration for a year as the chief economist for the Office of Management and Budget. Moved my family 1,300 miles up to McLean, Virginia, so I could work in the White House. And got my first paycheck taxpayer's expense, of course, because I'm a government employee. Um, there was a little bit of uh, about that, but that, that, was the, that was the job. And while I'm there, I'm getting my paycheck and I see this state income tax taken out. I had never seen that in my entire life. And when I saw that, I was upset. Um, and I think that is how the feeling will be. One day when Colorado um, does not have a personal income tax, people get their paycheck and they get every dollar. There's just something different about that to where you don't worry as much about the envy. That may be there in some capacity, but I want every one of my hard earned dollars. I know what's best for my family and my three kids than what some bureaucrat or politician But if we does. have a progressive income tax, you're still gonna be on the lower end of that. It's only the billionaires and millionaires that are gonna feel it and therefore, you'll feel good because you're gonna get a lower tax rate for you. Yeah, I want everyone to have a lower income tax rate, whether it's the upper income, lower income, because those ones at the upper income, they're gonna spend that much more wisely than a, a politician will at the end of the day. You're certain about that? I'm certain about there that. There are a lot of people who disagree with that assumption. You worked in the White House. All right, let me, let me, let me go this direction. <laughs> yeah. You worked in the White House. Did you talk to the president? Did you get to see him? Did you guys, you know, play badminton together? What was what was it? Um, so I I didn't I got to see him of course, but it wasn't a direct communication. Um, I was the chief commerce for Office of Management and Budget, so I worked under Russ Vote, who was the acting director of OMB at the time. So it was mainly to help him with a lot of the budget parts of, of looking at economic forecasting, uh, what's in the budget overall. I was able to get in a spending limit, a fiscal rule being discussed in the president's last budget, the first time that that had happened since Graham, Graham Rudman back in the Reagan administration. I remember that. Yes. Because I'm uh, old. Yeah. <laughs> you do not remember that. I do not, but I read about it. Uh, uh, I read, read a lot That's about what I want to hear. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, you know, and look, Trump didn't really care about government spending. I think we can all see that. Even the record shows that there were high deficits and a lot of that was on Congress, of course, but he could have vetoed some of that. And I think we needed to do a better job of, of spending. Um, but coming from a low-income family in Houston, Texas, and going to um, private school from kindergarten to second grade, public school from third grade to sixth grade, and then homeschool from seventh grade through 12th grade, uh, being a first-generation college graduate, getting a PhD in economics from Texas Tech University, uh, it was a remarkable because I had the opportunity to be in the situation room when COVID was going on, asking us what's gonna happen in the economy. And I was like, look, if you're gonna shut things down, which is what ended up happening, uh, governors did that, but I think the administration was pushing them in that direction, this is not gonna end well. And I was one who was pushing back hard to not shut down the economy, that this was not gonna end up good, out good, and there was gonna be massive deficits and debt because they were gonna have to bail everyone out or try to. That's essentially what happened. And we're still reaping the costs 
of what happened during that time from the massive inflation as, as Biden then came and doubled down on a lot of that and the Federal Reserve increased their balance sheet. And it's just kind of one thing after another to where I'm concerned now about the precedent that it also set for the next thing. Is it climate change that we need to shut down the economy? What is it going to be next? And so I think we've got to get our fiscal house in order. To me, our la largest national crisis is the national debt that's driven by excessive government spending. Which leads to, I think, the most important question I have, which yeah. is, what's the situation room like? <laughs> yeah. Is it, is, it, is, it like the, is it like the war room in... Uh, um, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Strangelove is bad lights and it's just big, huge round table and, and they're all there in a sinister way and it's, and it's like acres long. It's, it's, it's a small room. Um, really? Yeah. And it's a rectangle. Uh, the, how small? The, uh, 50 feet? Footage. Yeah, probably about 50 feet. It may be a little bit more than that, but it's, it's pretty small overall. It, you can see... And around, where is it? Um, it is in the West Wing. Um, is it downstairs? Right across, yeah, right across from the Navy mess where I could go eat at any time I, I wanted. And it's quite interesting. I mean, anybody can, well, you can't get through the door, but you can see it. It's like right there. Um, it's on the first floor First or floor, yeah. It's first floor right there. But you have to go down a little bit of stairs, but you don't go down an elevator or anything like that. So it's not, it's not like Get Smart where no. he's dropping down 20 stories into no. a concrete bunker. This is a situation room. No, definitely not. Definitely it's just, not. It's just a room. Yeah, it's just a room. You got some Ugh. screens around. Then you have the table, and then there's a round of chairs around it. So you, you can sit, seat maybe 30 people in the room. This is so... All right, so was Trump there when you were in this situation not, room? Trump wasn't there at the time. I mean... Um, in the Situation Room, because this was a, the group of economists from the Council of Economic Advisors, oh OMB, Larry Kudlow, things of that nature. Can you imagine anything closer to hell than being stuck in a room with 30 economists? <laughs> we had too many hands, too many hands. hands. I'm just curious, yeah. given, given your time at, at the Trump, um, Trump White House, what you're feeling now? I'm talking politically. Yeah. Um, and if you don't want to speak out of school, you don't have to. That's okay. But yeah. you, 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 you saw it up close. I thought Trump's term was transformational in a lot of ways, even though he's a complete narcissist, even though he's crazy, even though he's unhinged. The reforms that came through, not only the tax reform, but a million other regulatory reforms that were remarkably needed. Uh, I worry in a second term, he might not be able to attract the right people that he did in the first term. And instead, it's going to be a vengeance term. Yeah. Um, I, I agree with you. I think some of those were transformative when you think about the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the amount of you know lowering that corporate income tax rate from 35% to 21%, which makes it closer to the average of the developed world now. Lowering all the individual income tax rates, I think, was also important on the supply side of the economy to really see more productivity and everything else happen. The deregulation was huge. Uh, that may have been even more supportive of, of economic growth than the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Of deregulating what? what? Deregulating. Um, there was uh, some some work on the CAFE standards, the right. standards of, of, of that, of, of how much gas for, for vehicles. Um, that had been increasing under the Obama administration. So it was rolling some of that back. Um, the American Action Forum actually does a good analysis on a lot of the regulations that were in different administrations. And they showed that Obama increased it, I think, up to this point, about $300 billion um, at the same three-year mark of their presidency. You know, the Biden administration has been closer to $400 billion, just massive increases in regulation. Under the Trump administration was about $20 billion. So it was an increase. I would like to see cuts overall, but it was much less than we've seen in other types of administrations. And I just think that was huge to get government more out of the way. More needs to be done, but that was a step in the right direction. Um, some of the things that I think need to be improved on, though, um, going into the second term, which I, I doubt will actually be improved on, will probably be even worse, is the amount of government spending. We were trying to do our part as, at OMB and the president's budget actually looked at $4.6 trillion in savings over a decade. But when you put the rubber meets the road, spending kept going up. Because politicians, it doesn't matter if you're an R or a D, you hate saying no to anybody. Yep. You want to spend. It's, it's why Republicans love the taxpayer bill of rights until they get into office. And then they go, wait a second, I have to make choices because I can't spend all the money that's come in. That's why Republicans also hate hate Tabor. Yep. Just out of curiosity, yep. you know, you're in the White House. You actually were working in the old executive office building, which is this weird building next door, but they call it the White House. Uh, was 
Do people openly talk like, you know, the guy we're working for, he's a, he's crazy. It was like, did people whisper that? Do they talk about it? They go, what, what? That makes no sense. Why did he change it? What was a scuttlebutt? Not, not too much because I mean, at the end of the day, he's your boss, right? I mean, American people are your boss too, but um, that's your boss. And so you're going to do what you need to do in order to get stuff done. Um, but it was interesting because you never knew what he was going to tweet next. We could be working on one initiative going down this direction and then a tweet would come out and we'd have to turn around and go a different direction. So, I mean, it was an extraordinary experience. Don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. so it was management by tweet. Yes, basically. What does basically. the boss want? He didn't tell us in the staff meeting. But I'm reading right now on my phone, he wants us to do opposite. Yes. Or if there's something that he says, and then, and then we're like, okay, here's, the, here's what the Twitter says. Where can we find information that makes that, that, that's supportive of that in some capacity? So that was, you were always on your toes, uh, <laughs> that, to say the least, right? Um, it was an interesting job. It, one other thing that I'm a little concerned about, if there is a second um, uh, Trump term, would be the tariffs. Um, and the amount of protectionism that goes on that I'm a free trade guy. Look, I'm a classical liberal, more libertarian overall than anything else. And so there was a lot of things where I had to bite my tongue, which is one reason why I left when I did in May of 2020. I was like, Look, I got to get out of here. I got to get back why? to Texas. Um, well, I didn't like the direction of the shutdowns and the lockdowns. Um, I thought that was a, a, a terrible move. And I was also worried about my family being in Virginia that was probably going to be shut down a lot longer than they were in Texas, which they were. And so I wanted to get back to some sense of normalcy, some sense of freedom. Um, I think there was a lot better ways that should have been handled then. Um, but also, I just didn't feel like things were all necessarily headed in the right track. I think with the spending um, part of it on deficit spending, also with the tariffs, which are just taxes on Americans, um, and looking at protectionism. And if you look at maybe a potential second term, Trump's already mentioned a 10% tariff across the board on everyone, uh, on all the goods that we're importing. And that will lead to other trade wars, which doesn't help out with a lot of other issues in America. You gonna vote for him? Unlikely. Really? Yeah, uh, I didn't vote for him the first time. Uh, and, and I'm not sure if I, and I voted for him the second time, just given the situation. But right now, it's a it's a tough one. I, I don't I, I don't know that the policy initiatives would be better better for the country. I'm certainly not going to vote for Biden. I think that would be worse. Um, so it might be a third party, which some would say, well, I'm wasting my vote. But I also believe in principles, and I believe that in order for oh, me to have principles, a, I'm not a goofy I economist. Know. I believe in principles. <laughs> All right. Bring it back to Colorado. Yeah, yeah. The work you've done shows we can get to zero. If we put it on full steam ahead, we could get to zero income tax in 16 years. And we could do it bit by bit by bit. Uh, if only, if only we do two things. One, stop doing refunds. And every time we have a refund, cut the income tax. And that's going to keep growing. What if we did nothing but that? What if we if we didn't do the thing with bringing in all the the fees and enterprises back into the into the general fund? What if we just every time there was a surplus, cut the income tax? Would we get there eventually? We would, we would, and so that was where we got to about twenty years. So it wouldn't be that much more time to do really? just that. How, how do you figure that? Well. That's just using the amount of revenue that's coming in today, using historical averages and looking at the historical averages for population plus inflation, that gap is a surplus. And whenever you have that gap, you just keep buying down that tax rate until you get to zero. And that's where we got 20 years. You know, if you also looked at the tax expenditures, um, it would be much, you know, much shorter time frame, time frame than that 20 years. Uh, and, and, and that was something that we put on the table as, a, as the next step of looking at shortening that time frame. I think we could get it close to 10 years. I mean, just thinking about had Polis not expanded the tax breaks like he did over the last couple of years, instead of having a 4.4, you get to 3.25 just by doing that, just by reining those back in. And then you start using this approach of a buy down, reducing the tax rates over time with this path to zero, uh, you, we could get it down probably to 10 12 years compared to the 16 to 20 years by just using the surplus method. That also assumes that when there's a surplus that the legislature doesn't fee it out of existence uh, or play politics because they'd rather decide, I'm gonna give you the refund and not you the refund. So we have to find a way to stop those abuses from happening. And I'll tell you, this legislature is not gonna do anything 
you you suggested. That's unfortunate. And I think whenever you look at the data and you see how Colorado could be improving, I would just ask them, why don't you care about your people? Why don't you want to grow the economy, the productive part of the economy? Government can have different safety nets. It has its Medicaid and has these other types of programs. But the idea should not be to have a longer line to get on government programs. It should be a longer line to find jobs. And the productive private sector is where the jobs are going to be created whenever you can reduce government spending or at least slow the growth. I'm not even saying cut the budget, which I think maybe you and I would both agree needs to be done, but at least just slow the growth rate and you can have a lot more money back in the private sector. If this doesn't happen, and and it won't, yeah. it'll have to be citizens doing an initiative to, to get, them, get them to do this. When do we get competitive with other states? Or let me, mm-hmm. let me, let me put it a different way. Other states are doing this. They're doing it faster than we're doing it. And that's going to put us in a competitive disadvantage. People are already leaving Colorado because it's too expensive. We need more companies here who can give us good paychecks. At what point, at what point do we lose this, this fight for the lowest income tax? And I really do believe it is a 50-way battle for the lowest income tax. Yeah. And then the lowest regulatory state to do business in. It's why Tennessee is doing so remarkably well. It's why Florida and Texas are doing remarkably well. If we don't do this, what happens? If we don't do this, I mean, Colorado is going to continue to fall behind. It's not going to be able to be competitive with other states, to bring the best and brightest, to bring the businesses here, to allow for small businesses to flourish. What will end up happening is you have to pick more winners and losers to try to bring them in instead. And when that happens, everyone loses because now you have tax breaks for certain people. That means you're not broadening the base. You don't have the lowest rates. And those businesses that are here don't benefit when you're trying to bring those businesses in with all these tax breaks. Um, and, and, and you're correct that, you know, look, I think it's 15 states now over the last three years have been cutting taxes. Colorado's being one of them, but not fast enough not fast enough. And so in this laboratory of competition and federalism, we're seeing the case being made that we need lower taxes in Colorado. What I'm seeing out of the federal government is that things are not going to improve for, for a little, for some time. And so states are where the action has to be. And if states aren't making that action, they're going to continue to fall behind. And I'd hate to see that in Colorado. Colorado is one of my favorite states. If we cut taxes this dramatically, this quickly, we'll people suffer a loss of governmental services. No. No, because all it's doing is slowing the growth rate of spending. So it allows for politicians to better allocate the resources. In other words, better prioritize where those monies go. Today, whenever they just basically run off inertia, here's what we had last time, let's increase it and do it again. If you have a better governor in place, if you think about your car, it it allows for you to come in and say, here are our priorities. So whether that's education or healthcare or other types of programs, um, let's put that money here first. And then some of the other things um, we need to to have a better look at what's going on. Ways to do that are zero-based budgeting, performance-based budgeting, what's working, what's not, start from zero. Um, You can also do audits, independent audits of a lot of these government programs to see what's working and what's not. And then that gives you an indication of where these money should go. Let's end it on this, zero-based budgeting. Explain that real fast, because it is it is a wonderful tool to to rein in government spending and still get great governmental services. It really is. I mean, what zero, is it? Zero based budgeting is you start from scratch, start from zero and say, how much do I need of each one of these programs? We do that in our budgets for our family. And if we're budgeting conservatively for our families, whether it be, do I need to pay rent? Yes. Do I need groceries? Yes. Do I need uh, cable? Eh, maybe not. Let me do some streaming or something else. You go through all this and we're doing conservative budgeting for ourselves. Why shouldn't we want government to do it when it's not their money? They should be even more conservative and more sustainable budgeting than what we are as a family. And so I think by doing so in this zero-based budgeting approach, you could transform government to actually providing the provisions that people want compared to continuing to grow for everyone. People don't quite get when government spends a dollar this year, it means that automatically they're budgeting for a dollar and five mm. for whatever program it is for next for the next year. Yes. And it grows and then the buck ten the year after that. And it's set in motion. As Reagan once said, there's nothing closer to immortality than a new government program. 
But when you, at the beginning of the year, go, nothing is funded. Nothing. At any level. Now, let's build it up from, the, from scratch. What do we actually need? And it's amazing what we don't need. Mm -hmm. right. People want to see the reports. I assume they go to thinkfreedom.org. Exactly. All right. Vance, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. If you enjoyed that conversation, by all means, click one of these other great programs. We have the best conversations with the most fascinating Coloradans. And subscribe to our channel. Just click down below and hit that little bell button, too. You don't want to miss a single show.